Good evening, everybody. My name is Sam Solomon, and this is Signal Tower. Today's guest is Samuel Hewlett, who is a user experience designer. He runs useronboard.com, the popular site which breaks down and critiques the onboarding process for popular SaaS products. It's a fantastic resource for designers. If you haven't checked it out before, I highly recommend you do so. He's currently working on a book called User Onboarding, which delves further into the topic. And as you'll see, he's a bit modest, but uh, he definitely knows his stuff when it comes to onboarding. Today we'll talk about common UX mistakes a lot of startups make. We'll talk about how A-B testing and user experience design fit together. Finally, if you're a designer, developer, entrepreneur, go ahead and sign up for Signal Tower at signaltower.co. I'll work to bring you an insightful interview each week. Okay, guys, let's get started. Samuel, welcome to the show. It is very nice to be here. Is it fair to say that you're an expert in, in user onboarding? Uh, probably not, actually. Huh. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that I'm a, uh, I have a really big focus on and uh, that I'm really passionate about. Um, but it's also something that uh, is a relatively new project for me. The, the user onboarding site um, is something that, you know, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm making myself sound like... <laughs> well, your breakdowns are pretty good. Um, yeah. I guess let's go ahead and, and, and if you would kind of just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yep. So uh, I've been a UX consultant for quite a while now. Um, and I also did some st uh, stint at a uh, local SaaS uh, startup for a couple of years um, doing what I guess would be called, my title was customer success lead. So um, I guess going back to the uh, onboarding expertise, that was something that I really lived in at that company. But it just wasn't really called onboarding. It was more about uh, seeing how people were able to log in and get through the setup steps that they needed to and how long it took. Um, and since it was it was more enterprisey than like B2C for sure or B2B, um, it was a lot more hands on. So it literally involved like watching people progress through the steps. And if they took too long, then sending them an email It was all really, really hands on, high touch kind of stuff. So um, from there, that was something where having the UX side of things as well. Uh, it made a lot of sense for me to focus specifically just on onboarding. Right, right. Um, now, going what I guess between kind of uh, a, from a business to business, um, you know, product to business to consumer product. I guess kind of what are some of the differences um, that you'd see in onboarding processes? Well, I think one thing is that uh, onboarding is just so inherently metrics based that uh, when you look at a lot of UX oriented projects or engagements. It can a lot of be a lot of times be like we just want to make the site more fun or pleasant or things like that, um, as opposed to when you're specifically looking to apply UX to onboarding. Uh, it's really you know very easy to say this is our conversion rate of trials to paying customers and this is how long paying customers tend to stick around. So when you you know it's really it's a pretty uh, natural overlap between you can start talking about things like churn rates and conversion rates. Uh, time to adoption, time to activation, things like that, that you can really, you know, put, uh, put them on rails and, and look at uh, numbers in a really clean way. That's good. I actually have a whole kind of section to talking about conversion and experience design. So I'll save that for any more questions about that um, for oh, a little so bit later. To, to the, I, I, I guess I went off on a little tangent there. You were talking about B2B, B2C, and how yeah. those are different for onboarding. And the, what I was leading up to was uh, that, you know, obviously the more... The B2C is going to have a much wider uh, funnel to be dealing with. So you're going to have a lot more numbers and you're going to have a lot more fidelity in those numbers. And you don't, you know, if you want to run tests, they won't take as long, things like that. B2B, there's a little bit less, but it's also probably more tied to money. Um, so it's easier to look at things like return on investment and stuff like that, because, you know, there's probably a sub subscription model in place, things along those lines. And right. then B2E, B2E, it's a lot tougher because you know, I mean, it's so many times it's like, well, we'll just fly somebody out there because the numbers make sense and we'll just walk you through. Yeah, I understand. There's a, you know, I, I'm big on Atlanta startups and anyone who watches this show knows that. Um, but, you know, a lot of these companies, you know, that are, if you're, if you're trying to target like a Fortune 1000 company, a lot of times you only need one or two of those to get to, you know, to, to get to being profitable or get to being sustainable. So um, yep. there's definitely a difference in the number of customers. Let's talk about useronboard.com. Um, I think it's a fantastic project. And for those of you uh, watching, well, why don't you explain what useronboard.com is? Sure. Um, I can, yeah, I can talk about what it is and then I, or also how it came to be 
a thing at all. Uh, right now, it's it's a website of uh, slideshow teardowns that um, basically I I uh, the way I make them is I record myself going through the process and then I sort of give myself a live commentary on like oh I, this part is confusing to me or oh I get how this thing or this is the first thing that I noticed and I and that's a that's a good because it's putting me in the right mindset things along those lines um, and then I'll uh, go through and take screenshots of all of those. Uh, different steps that I had to go through and then basically turn my commentary into annotations and think about it a little bit more and, and then uh, try to come up with some major takeaways and themes and stuff like that and turn it into a slideshow and post it to the site. Yeah, it's. I mean, it really is a great resource and just going through and looking at them, like I love, you know, I look at Trello and Basecamp as kind of some of the elite, you know, products out there. Um, and it's really interesting to kind of break those down and step by step, you know, what does a user do from the time, you know, they hit they hit their landing page to the time they actually, you know, start learning how to use the application. Um, yep. It's great. Well, I guess tell us a bit about, you know, why you started user uh, useronboard.com. So uh, that was something where uh, kind of goes actually back to the, the book that I'm writing. Um, that was basically, you know, had a plan to build up an email list so that I could actually be able to sell it instead of just kind of making something and then trying to figure out how to sell it afterwards. Uh, so I, my, my initial plan was just to write guest posts that are all, you know, picking different onboarding topics and see if I could kind of put myself out there and build an audience that way. Um, and one thing that I always noted, like, uh, from having UX engagements, one of the very first things I would ever do is go through the, the, the sign up process and send, you know, annotations and slides to my clients. Right. Uh, and so I was like, you know, these things seem really valuable and uh, I wanted to, to share one. I thought that would make like for an interesting blog post or something along those lines, but I didn't feel comfortable, obviously, like airing cl my clients dirty laundry, so to speak. So <laughs> I was like, oh, well, I should just do it for, you know, just pick a random company and just just do that and you know then I wouldn't have any problem sharing that and stuff like that so on a whim I picked uh, less accounting the uh, accounting software and went through and I was actually really impressed with a lot of the elements there so it made a lot I felt a lot better about sharing it um, and I put it out there and, and uh, the next day I got a uh, an email from one of the founders and uh, I was like oh no but uh, actually <laughs> he's like hey I really liked uh, the all the points that you made and we've already made like half the changes that you pointed out and we're going to make the other half pretty soon. It's been really valuable for us. And I was like, oh, awesome. So uh, then I decided, like, I should really go for, like, something pretty big. And so I decided, um, you know, uh, like you mentioned, Basecamp and Trello or, you know, certainly Joel Skolsky and the 37 Signals team are both, like, heroes of mine. So I thought Basecamp's probably got to have a pretty good one. Yeah. Um, so I thought I'll go break down Basecamp's onboarding thing. And uh, I uploaded it to SlideShare. And, like, it had to, like, re-render it. And it was just... It looked really terrible, and so like I remember like I went home that night and told my wife like yeah I worked all day on this base camp thing and then by the time I put it up it looked like crap and felt like a whole waste of day and I uh, I came back like the next morning it had like thousands of views and people were like hey this thing's really awesome and so uh, after that I was like uh, I got a recommendation I'm in a uh, am I allowed to curse on here Yeah sure go ahead okay. So there's a uh, Justin Jackson. Um, oh yeah, uh, Justin Jackson, uh, product yeah, people. What's that? He does the product people podcast. Yeah, and he also he's in the Northwest as am I. I'm in I'm in Portland, um, and so uh, he has a Just Fucking Do It group, which is like a you know enter, uh, um, local entre entrepreneurs or solopreneurs uh, just getting together because like it's easier to you know hold yourself accountable with other people and stuff like that. Um, and so somebody noticed that I had done that there and said like, you should really think about spinning this out into its own site because people would be more likely to share it than if it's just some dude's blog. Um, cause I was just posting it under my own name on my own blog. Right. And so I was like, Oh, that's really not a bad idea. And at that point it was just really putting the pedal to the metal to see how many I could get up there. And, uh, the response has been really, really cool. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, you're putting out there something that I think is incredibly useful for, you know, founders and designers and it's it, you know it's it's interesting it's a really interesting you know kind of critique um what i guess from all the product teardowns you've done so far um are there any key lessons that uh you've learned from yeah for sure i mean um i've only done maybe I, well, i've only launched about six or seven right now and i've probably only gone through about 20 with like really focusing on them um so it's still kind of early but there are definitely definitely some themes that um, I picked up pretty quickly that 
unless if you're really paying attention to a lot of different onboarding experiences, you probably wouldn't really see. Um, like one of the biggest ones is just uh, preserving people's attention throughout the entire process. Um, because if you really make it super complicated at the beginning, there's like, I almost think of attention as being like this fixed quantity, like almost like gas in a car. And if you're trying to get somewhere and you run out of gas, like you would just run out of attention and be like, all right, I'm done. And if you're not, if you don't get to where you're supposed to, by that time that happens, then that's not going to be a successful onboarding experience. So um, looking at really only showing people the exact things that they need and making the process as straightforward as possible to make sure that, you know, no matter how much gas you have to overuse the metaphor, I guess, uh, you know, that they'll, they'll get to where they need to go. Right, right. Are there, you know, have, have you seen any patterns of specific flows that you've seen that, you know, work really well or? Um... Yep. Uh, yeah, I kind of have like nicknames for them, um, you know, that I like, as I do more of them, I'd like to kind of formalize into more of like a pattern library or something right. like that. But, um, you know, there's two that really stand out to me, like I call like the foot in the door technique, where a lot of times you'll see, uh, sign up now and it's just like name and email address and you're like oh that's super easy sure and then so you type them in and then it takes you to a form that has like six or seven fields and those two are preloaded. so you know you wouldn't have done the whole form if it had been presented all at once right uh, and then then it also feels like you're making progress because you're like oh i already have two out of seven filled out this is kind of it's it's a little sneaky i guess a little bit but it's also like okay well you're just kind of making things digestible. Well, that, that's one of those things when I see that when the form's already filled in with information I've already put in somewhere else or it can pull from somewhere else. That's one of those things that I, I look at and I'm like, it's one of those tiny things when I'm signing up for a product or, or whatever it is that I, you know, I think that that's, that's really awesome. Why doesn't, why, why aren't more people doing that? Yeah. Um, or like another, not, not really specific to onboarding, but like one thing I'm constantly encountering is uh, if you forget your password, it's usually like enter your email address and password You'll try a couple times. It doesn't work. Your guesses aren't right. Okay, I click the forget password button, and then it, there's just an empty field that says enter your email address, where it's like, I have already entered it like three times right. when I was trying before. Like, it shouldn't be that hard to just carry that through and just pre-populate that field later. Little tiny things like that, but just, you know, really reducing the cognitive load that it takes for people to accomplish what they're looking to do. Um, and not a, this, as a suggestion, I was just thinking about it. One of the I guess how does how does uh, lazy registration uh, products that are doing lazy registration like 500 pixels where basically you get to use the product uh, before you actually um, have to really sign up or put in your email? Um, mm -hmm. Have you done? Have you looked at any of those? How you know how? Uh, what do you think about the user experience with those? Uh, I'm I'm generally in for it. Uh, for it, um, the, the I think one really great example is uh, Brennan Dunn. Um, but his product is called PlanScope, um, and uh, his his is basically it's almost like a hybrid freemium model where you can kind of go in and you have like a sandbox project that you can work within. And right. then as soon as you want to make like a real one, um, then you know then you would have to create your account, which would also I believe involve setting up a credit card and making payment. Um, but I think that's a great great way to let people in. It's not like a totally handicapped version of the of the product it's you're basically you know you can totally use it but only once or only right. one single product project um so yeah i, I mean I, as a general rule only asking people to to provide what they absolutely have to um makes sense to me what i guess on the flip side kind of what you know what uh you know common ux blunders or mistakes uh do you see you know constantly uh, one thing that certainly comes up all the time for me is uh, submitting forms and not knowing what's happening. Uh, like you click the submit button and everything just kind of sits there and then all of a sudden like the page changes. Um, and so like a lot of sites, you know, especially if they're really high traffic, you can have latency of three seconds, four seconds where somebody's just like, I don't maybe, or you just start clicking it over and over again. So it's a really, really small UX detail, but just like, you know, ghosting out the submit button or putting a spinner inside it or having some copy that says we're sending your information or whatever that's happening this is what's happening next yeah just communicating like you know there's one thing like i was like just just tell me what you're doing because you know so um that's definitely that's definitely a thing um i'm trying to think of other common ux problems um I, one thing that I think that there's a lot of opportunity to improve upon um, in the onboarding processes I've seen 
are handling black, uh, blank slates, or sorry, blank states, where you come in and maybe they've pre-populated it with something like an example project, like uh, Basecamp does that really, really well. Um, but sometimes you'll come in to something and it's like, you have no notifications or you have no other people in your thing. It's like almost accusatory uh, <laughs> and it doesn't really tell you how. You don't have any that. friends. Why don't you have any friends? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so it's, it's uh, looking at basically, and it, and it seems like it's handled in, in two ways. Either you kind of pre-populate it with dummy data, which I'm not totally against, um, but it still doesn't really help people accomplish what they're looking to do. Um, you know, it, directly. It's more of just like, I kind of think of it like a cooking show where they're like, here's one I prepared earlier. Like, it's not not you making your own meal. Um, and then there's also one thing that I see all the time is like Joyride or Walk Me Through or things like that, where they're basically putting labels on the interface saying like, this is what this thing does and this is what this thing does. Or you have to click through and there's like six different Right, things. here's the, the tour. Yeah, and personally, I'm... I. I have not seen those work really well. And, and anecdotally, they've always been really frustrating to me that um, basically like if your interface is confusing to people, like I don't think the answer is more interface on top of right. it. Um, you know, like uh, Jason Freed a long time ago posted a Flickr group called Signs on Signs where um, if somebody would have a sign that's like, you know, watch your step. And then there's another sign that says like, look at this sign. <laughs> um, and it, it's kind of like this funny concept. And he said like, it's, it's he likes it because or he, he finds it interesting because it's literally things pointing at bad design um and so like if the sign's not working just change the sign so it works as opposed to putting another sign pointing to the sign uh That's... in the same way like you know don't point out how confusing your interface is just let you know make it so it's not confusing that's great <laughs> i love that um i guess going kind of back through tutorials or walkthroughs um you know i feel like Obviously, there are a lot of products, Trello and Basecamp are very kind of list oriented that kind of show, I guess, what they have. But what about uh, other products that, you know, it may be, you know, I don't know, maybe it's, it's like YouTube or, uh, you know, some sort of other like video player or something where, you know, you don't really have just kind of like lists of things where you can kind of explain what each of these pieces do. Uh, the question is, how do you get people engaged with with I guess, I guess kind of what options for products like that, that, you know, don't kind of have lists of different things. Um, I would say, you know, well, let's see if you're looking to drive engagement in something that's not step one, step two, step three, yeah. um, or maybe it's not even all going to happen in your first run experience. Email is great to really drive engagement that if you're, you know, if you have somebody's email address and you can be, you know, pick your spots well, where you're actually providing value. But basically making, you know, uh, emails, transactional emails being sent out for because of particular activity or non-activity. Uh, I think that's a great way to really kind of juice people in and get them going again. Um, does that answer your question? Or? Well, I guess I guess I was saying so, you know, products like Basecamp, you log in in the interface. Basically, um, you, you know, you've kind of got like a list of things. So there's like projects and then there's like messages within that project. Uh, or maybe even Trello is a better example. It's just kind of like a, a board with different cards on it. Yep. And I, I know from the the Trello walkthrough, each of those cards kind of say what they do or like how they got there. Yep. Um, but I guess not all not all products, uh, you know, you know, have that. So I guess my question is like for something like I, I don't know. I, I guess uh, YouTube or. Uh, I'm just trying to think of other products that don't aren't really don't really have like lists where you could just kind of go ahead and put this in. Well, let me let me take a step back. Like I, I think that really the essence of what onboarding is 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 a, it's a two two step process that you have your marketing public site where you're just trying to get communicate the value that you provide to people right. to get them to take that step to sign up, and then really then you're entering into like onboarding mode. Um, and I would not mistake like onboarding with on activating features or things like that. I would say onboarding really is delivered when somebody receives the value they thought they were getting when they were signing up. And so, uh, for example, like I just did a teardown on Vimeo's onboarding experience. Um, and they are establishing the perception of the value that they offer is you'll get to host your videos in this beautiful format and share them with people you love or something along those lines. <laughs> and, um, and 
you you know so that that's like that's what i think of as like okay that's the goal as soon as i hit as soon as i hit sign up and start that onboarding process the quickest i can get to that moment of realization of of getting to what they promised me uh, at the onset is that's the more successful the onboarding experience will be so that involves you know creating an account and uploading a video and giving it a title and picking out the thumbnail and publishing it and maybe ultimately embedding it or something like that. Right. So you can look at the you can make it a sequential you know series of steps that somebody needs to do to get the value that they perceived when they signed up for it. Um, but you know as far as if it's a list or if it's uploading a video or whatever the interface is, um, you know I, I I think that's not not the there's nothing that's a deal breaker there. So the key with onboarding is to show the value of the product. Uh, to, yeah, to, to get, I, you know, and I would even take a step further back than that and um, look at not looking at it from a, such a product centric standpoint, um, because that's a, it's, a, it's a slippery slope to say, okay, well, somebody has to do these six activities because that's what our product requires, as opposed to what's the shortest path from this person thinks that, that this product is going to make them awesome at something to them being awesome at that thing. Like that's, that's really fair. to me what the definition of onboarding is and, and whether it takes one step or 30 doesn't really matter. And so like, I almost think of it like, um, like, did you play like Super Mario Brothers on Nintendo as a kid? Yeah. <laughs> so like, so like you, you see a flower pop up and you're like, awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to go get that flower and then I'll be able to shoot fireballs and it's going to be rad. So like a lot of products, like value propositions and things like that are like, Hey, we're a flower. Check out the petals that we have and things like that. Where it's like, really talk about how awesome you're gonna be when you use the flower. Like the the fireballs is the thing that you should be really selling. So um, get people to shoot fireballs as quickly as possible is to me what onboarding is, not to get them to to get a flower. That might be the best analogy I've ever had on the show. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. All right, so I guess you know of you know who do you think is is kind of doing the best job of onboarding? I'm sure you've looked. I know you've done several kind of product teardowns and probably looked at you know countless other other products. Who do you think is is uh, is do is doing the best job? Um, Invision is a company that I did a teardown or a product that I did a teardown of, um, and there was definitely something where I was just like, I don't really have a lot. I kind of have a color coded thing where like blue is pointing out things that they're doing well and orange is pointing out things that they could like improve upon. And like, I did not have to use my orange pen very much at all on that one. Um, really, you know, having that clear idea of like, uh, you know, one thing for me uh, that, that speaks to a really good onboarding experience is not really, is pre preventing people from having those questions or anxiety or ambiguity as to what they're supposed to do at any time, a given time. Um, but even though you can't reduce that completely, having contextual information that that helps people figure out what they need to do in the right spot. Uh, how would I put it? Like anticipating what people's needs are going to be in, in a very specific different set of context and then providing them whatever they need uh, to, to do what they need to do. So uh, Envision does a really good job of basically, you know, framing the value at the onset of saying, you know, this is, this is what you'll be good at once you start using our application and then step by step by step, every question that I had was answered right within the context of that. So um, a great example of something that doesn't really happen that often is um, I signed up for like five or six different uh, email services, like get response and campaign monitor and constant contact and things like that. And all, almost every single one said, um, name your campaign. And so, and I didn't know if that was going to be the subject line of the email or not. And so it was really great. There were a couple, unfortunately, not even most of them did this, but a couple said, this will not be shown to the public. And so, <laughs> you know, it'd be great if like that question never even popped up in my head, but the fact that it did, and then it was immediately responded literally right under the field where you're supposed to be answering the question was like, a, oh, thank God. Okay. You knew exactly what my question was going to be. And you answered it right in the area that, it, what, that I was looking at when I, that question popped up in my head. I didn't have to go search it out, things like that. Um, that, that to me is a, is a hallmark of really, really attentive, detail-oriented onboarding. All right. Um, when you're approaching, you know, uh, an onboarding experience or just kind of, um, I guess, where do you begin? What's your process like for, um, you know, kind of breaking down these, these user experience flows? 
I think that because the entire thing is driven by people perceiving and then receiving the value, um, getting really specific on who are you making, what, what sort of person are you making awesome? What specifically are you making them awesome at? Um, and then also looking you know, deeply into what is involved for someone to switch over to your product. Because even if they're not working, even if they don't have a competing product, that's like a real clear, you know, um, in the same space as yours, like they're still doing something to solve that problem right now. And so there is going to be some inertia and pain of switching to get from, from whatever they're doing to, to signing up with you and paying you money in theory to do that. So like, you know, if you're um, trying to think of a good example, maybe um, any email company, you know, maybe somebody's just in Gmail sending them all out BCC right now and right. they need to maintain the list better and do certain things that are, doesn't look as janky or whatever. And so they're, then they're like, okay, I need to step this up. I need to be more awesome at sending out emails. So I'm gonna sign up for a service and start paying them. Um, and then specifically looking at the, the, the switching moment, like what's involved in that? Like you're gonna have to get all your contacts out of Gmail or maybe they're in an Excel file or something like that. So you're looking at the holistic experience of what it takes for somebody to become more awesome at sending email through you um, through a lot of different things that, that probably don't even have to happen online or at least through your interface. That right. putting yourself in the understanding of what's really motivating this person to step up their game right now and what are all of the environmental aspects of you know what might be pre preventing them from doing that and how can we ease that path that much much more better trying you're just trying to remove friction at as many points as possible uh for sure yeah and and just you know understanding what those friction points are to begin with is much more than you know that's the much harder part yeah yeah um i i guess you know i, I let's talk a little bit about you know user experience versus um you know, conversion design, because I, yep. I, I kind of, I kind of, you know, see interface design as a whole, uh, as, um, you know, you've got, oh, what do you call those, a Venn diagram, and you've uh -huh. got visual design is one circle, and then you've got user experience design as another circle, and then I think you've got conversion design as another circle. Yep. Um, so your blog on Medium is called Designing for Results. This is true. I, I guess, so where, you know, where should the line be drawn between conversion testing and, and user experience? What specifically do you mean by conversion testing? Like just So I'm thinking testing. like, uh, you know, specifically A-B test, like A-B testing, you know, this, this button should be blue instead of it should be green. Um, yep. You know, at, at what point um, are you just, uh, does conversion testing maybe become deceptive? Um, uh, I would say that uh, not to mistake the forest for the trees there, that um, I don't think that they're separate disciplines. I think that they, that um, design as experiment or scientific design is a really intelligent way to go about providing user experience design. Um, that if you aren't paying attention to what the impact of your recommendations are, uh, I don't know how you can um, improve as a UX designer, and I don't know how you can uh, have a high degree of confidence in the recommendations that you're making uh, on an ongoing basis. So to me, the, the user experience medium is people's behavior, the behavior of people using the site, not the pixels of the site itself. Um, and so measuring that behavior and understanding, trying to make that behavior visible in some way so that you can see how you're influencing it is, is to me just a complete requirement. Well, okay, so I've got just to kind of, I've got an example in mind uh, to kind of what I think, uh, you know, is that, you know, shows the difference between conversions and user experience. Um, cool. Pop-up modals on, sign up pop-up modals on sites is, is kind of a hot topic in the design community or it seems to uh, sure. have been of lately. Uh, a lot of people will tell you that, um, you know, putting a pop-up modal on there is just like using JavaScript to do pop-ups, you know, what we saw in the 90s and early 2000s, um, you know, people will say that, you know, they, they hate them, they provide a terrible user experience. But at the same time, I know this, you know, just from testing, I've done a good bit of conversion testing uh, that they'll perform incredibly well. Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of, you know, what, what is your opinion of kind of the, the pop-up email sign-up? Uh, I would say, you know, that... 
let's see, how would I put this? I think that it's a question of your, of what you value, that there's, there's short-term uh, optimization and long-term optimization. And if you are going to say, I'm okay with annoying people to get their email address, and then hopefully I can kind of nurture the relationship from there, even though it didn't start on like the, the smoothest foot, um, smooth foot. I don't know. That's weird. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I would say that like, it's a question of what is it that you're really measuring? Because if you're looking to build an audience in a way that involves, uh, intangibles or just, you know, having people not, uh, think poorly of you because you're just like, you know, immediately optimizing the, the very second somebody comes to the site, um, that you can also measure that and see what the impact of certain things are there too. So it's really a question of, you know, like, I think there's a saying something along the lines of like, the important thing about measurement isn't the me thing you're measuring, it's asking the right questions to begin with. Um, so, you know, I would say that the question in this example is, does it create more uh, email addresses or signups in, in the immediate thing that you're measuring, which is on page load? Um, but it doesn't, I don't know if you're, well, hypothetically, you're not measuring, are there as many people sticking around for six months? Or are there as many people that are um, recommending the, this hypothetical blog to their friends or things like that, that would be other um, real clear indications of goodwill or audience building and things like that. So um, to me, you can, you can create an experiment that will tell you something about any, you know, anything that you're doing. Um, so it's a question of like, what is it that you really want to find out? And then how do you build an experiment, experiment that will, will uh, uh, shoot, I have totally stalled at the end there. Uh, how do you build an experiment that will reveal to you what you're looking to find out? All right, I, I think that I think that's fair. It, you know, I, that's kind of what my thoughts on on them were. If you need to do something in the short term, I don't like them. I, you know, I've thought about about you know doing it on you know on on Signal Tower, but you know, I feel like um, you know that kind of impedes what people came there for. And if they think the quality is is good enough as as it is, they'll they'll subscribe anyways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the same time, I think that probably by doing something like that, I could can increase conversions, but I'm hoping that, you know, the goodwill, um, uh, you know, that in the type of people that, that, you know, uh, I'm trying to attract will, will see that and rather subscribe as opposed to, you know, you know, seeing that there's a modal and just leaving. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I made a very similar decision, uh, with the user onboard site. Like, I mean, that's obviously a uh, big reason it exists is to build audience and get email subscriptions and things like that. And, you know, it certainly occurred to me that like having a persistent sign up with, you know, are you enjoying the slideshow? Then like, you know, enter your email address here form that was visible the entire time while you were going through the slideshow would probably lead to more um, uh, signups. But it was a, you know, a conscious decision of mine that I was like, I just want the experience like to be, I want the slides to be as big as possible. I don't want any distracting elements on the page. I just want people to really be able to, to pour themselves into the slides. And then at the end, maybe I'll ask for a sign up instead of just you know putting that out there. I could run a test and say, well, if I did also have a persistent one or if I had a persistent one in the footer instead, would that create more email addresses you know, or conversions on average or not? And have some you know numbers to work with as opposed to just kind of going on blind faith that my decision's right. But it's also a thing where like, I just feel more comfortable doing something that's aligned with my values, you know? Right, right. So, and, and I feel like, you know, we, there's, you know, part of the reason you're on this show is because I think a lot of the people in my audience, um, you know, would be interested in, in, you know, what you'd have to say. And I, I feel like a lot of the people that are maybe a little bit more technical, the people that are kind of in UX, you know, may be offended by it, may be offended by something like that. Um, by the testing? By, or not, not by testing, by, by, you know, putting, uh, by putting a modal up, by trying oh. to force signups. Um, yeah. Or, or just anybody really. I mean, especially if it's something where like you're asking me to rate the experience before I've even had it or, or weird things like that. You know, I think that it's, it's, I guess if it works, then it works. But I mean, it's kind of like, are you going to build a really cool house or are you a strip mall, you know? Well, so for, there are, you know, like there's a lot of there's a lot of people putting together startups. Um, you know, I guess what kind of met what kind of metrics or tests should early stage startups be putting together? I think it's really rough for early stage startups that you're not you know you're not going to have the kind of traffic where you can roll out an A/B test and you know get results back within a week or two necessarily. Uh, I think you know what you're really going to look to do um, 
earlier stage is, is go after, I guess, what people would call qualitative uh, results more so than quantitative ones. So going out and talking to people, getting a real clear um, understanding of the intent and the value that people perceive when they come to the site or the just what you really make people better at, but a lot more hands-on, a lot more face-to-face -face, um, than just putting out a survey and going with that. Well, so I guess it's so qualitative, you need to go out and you need to ask questions. Um, you know, what, what type of questions would you go out and ask potential customers? How, you know, how do you begin that conversation? Well, uh, my general recommendation is to ask as few as possible. I think it's really easy. If you're doing something um, as bold as starting up your own business, uh, you're probably pretty headstrong. You probably feel some pretty strong convictions uh, that, that, you're, what, that you're onto something good. Um, and, you know, if you're looking at, I guess in the same way, like, you know, with experimenting or designing by experimenting and things like that, it's, it's really a question of, can we validate or invalidate our current beliefs, you know, more than anything. And if you can't do that with numbers on your website, you can still do that in person by talking to somebody and, and really going out of your way not to ask leading questions. So especially if they're your friends or people that you have some sort of association with, um, if you're going into an interview and you're saying, hey, so I'm thinking about making this thing, you'd pay $40 a month for that, right? Like that's a- that's It's a loaded a question. question. Right, you are, you are selling to one person, you're not uh, interviewing a, a person that you could then sell to, a, a, you know, use their words to scale out and sell to thousands of people. So it's really not trying to persuade people into thinking what you think, it's really trying to get an idea of how, how do people frame this in their words, what's the value as they see it, or can I just find out that this isn't a really good idea sooner than later and not spend the next year building it? So instead of that, you know, this costs $40, how would you, how would you, approach, how would you approach that? What would you say to you know, a, a potential customer? Uh, pricing is pretty hard, especially if you don't have a product in place to actually you know, see if people will cut you a check or not. Um, one thing that I use as an example is uh, another like a leading question would be like, um, would you pay five, would you pay six dollars for a candy bar? And somebody might be like, okay, well, yeah, I probably would. Like, I could see myself doing that. But if you actually ask them to recall specifics, instead of projecting ahead, hypothetically, what they might do, uh, ask them to recall specifically what they have done and say, basically, can you tell me the last time you bought a six dollar candy bar? Pretty, pretty likely somebody would be like, I, I don't think I have, <laughs> you know? And so you're looking at, okay, is this actual behavior that's already out there that I can uh, work with or is this something where I'm going to have to try to invent the marketplace or things along those lines So for one thing asking specifics about things that have actually happened when you're interviewing people and not asking them to Predict the future uh, or speculate on what they might do um, Is one big thing that I picked up on and then also uh, As far as pricing is concerned It's a lot easy like a really strong sign that you're onto something is if you can get people to to actually cut you a check before you have that product in place and maybe you offer a discount or something along those lines. But if you say, I'm thinking about building this thing, I think it's gonna take me this long. If, if you would commit to being one of my beta customers, I'll give you 10% off for life or something like that. Would you cut a check for me right now? Um, and if somebody's not willing to, when you don't have that product in place, they'll still not be willing to when you do have that product in place. <laughs> so, uh, or at least, you know, there, there's obviously like a little risk there, but you know, building a product that nobody wants isn't gonna make it easier to sell. That's right. That's right. Um, so still kind of talking about the, you know, the focus on startups. Um, I guess, you know, when going through um, what, I guess, where do you draw the line between we need to ship this product or we need to go out and we need to talk to more people or we need to focus on our onboarding process? Uh, I'm not, not really sure. Could you rephrase the question? So I, I guess, you know, what how much focus should startups put on on user experience first you know kind of in the startup world there is this this mentality that we just need to keep shipping things like right. we just need to ship um but a lot of times um you know talking going and kind of doing these interviews or going and kind of looking at the onboarding process um kind of takes longer um i guess you know where where would you draw the line how would you go about you know, being able to ship and being able to, to design a great user experience. Okay, um, you know, in the parlance of lean startup, I think that you can kind of look at two phases, uh, roughly speaking, of a company. There's the 
uh, trying to validate or, in, or seeking out a business model, a scalable business model, and then actually scaling that business model out. And in the searching for a business model phase, that's when you're doing a lot of uh, hypothesis testing, validating, invalidating, um, at just like, is this something that people will pay for? Whatever my, my business idea is, is this, is this a viable one or not? Um, and in, in that case, I actually don't think onboarding, like a really awesome onboarding experience is going to uh, provide you with the highest ROI. And I also don't think that it's going to help you validate or invalidate your business. That if you have something where people will crawl through breaking, broken glass to get there, um, then that's a really strong sign of, of a really viable business. Huh. And then once you want to hit that scale stage, then make them not have to crawl through broken glass. Right. But not having broken glass doesn't mean people will want to go to the thing that you're getting. So I would tend to say, unless if UX is for whatever reason, the differentiating, differentiating factor for your business, then that's something you're going to need to test really early on. Like it basically is whatever, you know, product X plus design is that if that's your business model, then obviously you need to, that's the riskiest assumption that you have that you need to validate or invalidate as soon as possible. And then you would really need to invest in design. But if what you're offering isn't that, and it probably isn't, uh, I would say that it's honestly, you know, and it pains me to say this as a UX designer, but it's probably not the first thing that you really need to focus on. That being said, I'm definitely not advocating that you think of UX as something that you can staple on at the end or like just sprinkle UX on afterwards that uh, I think it's really a lot more. I, I recently read a cool quote that was something like, uh, your brand is a trailing indicator of your culture, uh, something along those lines. And, and I think that's the same to be said for UX, that if you really value um, people having positive experiences with your company online and off, um, and that's something you really put at the forefront, then, then it's going to show up in the user experience of your site and things along those lines. And if you don't, then it, culturally speaking, ha, you know, there's certainly been UX engagements where it's just like they're outsourcing this because they just really don't care. And it's going to really come through and there's not going to be any kind of UX contracting or or you know seasoning that's going to save you from that. That's fair. I think that's definitely fair. Um, I guess you know what. Obviously, other than useronboard.com, you know what what resources um, would you recommend for people that are interested in getting into user experience design? So just UX in general. Yeah, UX UX in general. Um, I would say that the things that most impacted me uh, were two things uh, that both of which um, I came across because I follow Ryan Singer of 37 Signals on Twitter. Um, one is the jobs to be done framework or concept, um, which I could go, I could probably talk all day about that, but I shouldn't go into too much detail, but um, getting really, really uh, a really strong understanding and doing a deep dive into that as a, as a concept and a framework uh, has certainly really um, informed my approach to UX. Uh, and then also another thing that he linked to that really was a huge eye opener for me is there's a um, business of software talk by Kathy Sierra, I think from 2009. Um, that's something along the lines of like how to, um, how, I wish I could remember the name of it, something along the lines of like generating user awesomeness or something like that. And the general concept is if you want to create people who are evangelists for your company, just make them really good at the thing that you, your company exists to make people good at and it will, all the rest will kind of take care of itself. and. Uh, I really, I, it's an hour long and I don't normally tell people to watch an hour long video, but that one I, I, I send everyone's way as, uh, you know, any, any opportunity that comes up. Watch that one and this one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about jobs to be done because, you know, everyone does kind of look up the 37 signals. They obviously take experience design, um, you know, very seriously. Uh, would you talk a little bit about jobs to be done? Sure. Um, I think that the, the milkshake example is probably the most famous one, and that's probably like the easiest way of wrapping your head around it. Um, do, I can just dive into that, or yeah, yeah, let's. Okay. So the story goes that uh, there was this fast food company that wanted to sell more milkshakes, and they would get uh, consumer panels together and ask them if they wanted them to be chocolatier or thicker, or have different things in them or whatever, and, and get people's opinions, and then they would take those opinions, go and try to you know, change their milkshakes around and none of that was working and they did like competitor analysis and looked at what the other fast food chains were doing and tried to copy them and that wasn't working. Um, so they wound up hiring this team where they sent out a single person to one of their locations and he just stood in the restaurant all day long and recorded anytime somebody bought a milkshake, 
uh, whether they were alone or, or with someone else and whether they had it there or, uh, uh, or left with it to go. And it turned out that like half of the milkshakes were sold before 9 a.m. And they're like, well, this is crazy. Why, why would people be doing this? And so they sent the guy back the next day. And this time he stood outside the restaurant. And whenever, oh, so they, they were being sold uh, before 9 a.m. And the people always bought them alone and left with them without having them. And so this time he stood outside. And anytime a, an individual person with a milkshake would walk out of the store, he would say, you know, in, in, in not in a weird way, what job are you hiring that milkshake to do? Which is basically saying, the last time you found yourself in this situation, you know, what, 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 what other than a milkshake were you using uh, to, to solve this problem that you have? Um, and suddenly it was really apparent that their competitors weren't, uh, you know, the other fast food chains or things like that. Like their competitors were donuts and apples and breakfast food to go and things like that. And basically what they're saying is, I have this really long, boring commute and I don't want to be really hungry before lunch comes along. So it's nice to have this thing that I can hold in one hand and kind of stir and fiddle with. And it also like staves off my hunger. Um, so they were able to take this realization that this is like the job people were hiring the milkshake to do and completely reformulate their, their entire product around it. So knowing that if it lasted really long, that would be better. They uh, were able, they knew, okay, that gives us a really strong signal that we should make these thicker instead of thinner. And knowing that they bought them in the morning and left and it was part of their commute, let's set up a, a kiosk where people can come and buy them, at, you know, with a swipe of a credit card and leave instead of standing in line, things along those lines. Um, so it gave them, a, Clayton Christensen is the name of the person behind this. Um, and he has kind of a similar quote along those lines that being, you know, 40 year old white male does not cause me to buy the New York Times. It might be correlated with that. Um, but like, you know, if you're building your demographics around um, attributes like age and, and, you know, income or things along those lines, as opposed to building your demographic around what people who have problem X and this is what we solve, it's a lot easier to align your entire business model, product, marketing, everything around. This is what we make you really good at in this particular way. And to kind of dive into the 37 signals kind of example of that is I think that's when, you know, Jason Freed kind of realized they're not competing, that Basecamp's not actually competing with other project management software. You know, people are emailing themselves tasks and using email to communicate with one another and who their real competitor is actually email. So that's kind of the, the milkshake. The milkshake's just such a great example, though. Um, you know, I, I love that example. Yep. Um, I guess, uh, do you have any other kind of thoughts or, or, or last, last comments to leave the audience with? Um, you know, I, I watched a couple of your other interviews and, and I think one of your questions was like, uh, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs or something along those lines? Um, and I was like, oh, I bet he's going to ask me that. So I should, I should well, that, you get, you can answer that question then. All right. <laughs> Um, you know, I would say that my advice is uh, to really learn to love uh, being rejected, as weird as that sounds. Um, there was years ago, I read a Chris Dixon blog post called, uh, kind of sensationally called, if you're not being rejected on a daily basis, you're not trying hard enough. And I remember being like, all right, I, I don't know, that sounds, I don't think that sounds like a lot of fun, and you might be wrong, so I probably won't take that advice. And slowly but surely, I did. And uh, it's really something like when you when you really lean into being rejected, basically only two good things can happen. One is it turns out you're not rejected and whatever awesome thing you thought you were going to be rejected for happens and that's great. Or you are rejected in a way that gives you an indication of what you can improve about yourself or what you're doing um, to not necessarily be rejected in that way in the future. So um, from a career standpoint and also from a business standpoint, just rapidly going out and um, putting yourself out there and seeing what happens is something that I really didn't used to do. And, and now that I am, I'm, I'm finding a lot of success, uh, you know, personal success with that. And also, you know, it's just kind of a question of going back to validating and validating, just, you know, get out there and see what, see what, uh, stop speculating on things and just seeing what actually works and what doesn't and basing your decisions around that. Great. Samuel Hulick, where can people find you? People can find me, uh, I guess, useronboard.com is the, the, the hot spot to find me right now. Um, there's also a Twitter account, at useronboard. Um, and then my, my personal address is uh, samuelhulick.com, S-A-M-U-E-L-H-U-L-I-C-K, uh, and also at Samuel Hulick on Twitter.
Perfect. Thank you for joining me today. It's been a true pleasure. Okay, everybody, that's our show today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, go to SignalTower.co and subscribe. We're also on Facebook and Twitter, if that's your thing. If you have any suggestions for guests, uh, have any suggestions about how the show can be better, or if you just want to say hi, uh, I'd encourage you to reach out to me there. All right, thanks for watching.